picked up where we left off last week. Last week we ended up uh, in, chapter, in chapter 8, verse 9 of 2 Corinthians, and we'll pick up in 10 and probably just go through about 15 today. So let's, uh, if you would, open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, and I'll start reading in verse 9, and there are some um, scriptural references up here if you need one. So, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'll start in verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, whoever gathered little had no lack. All right, let's pray. Father, again, as we come to considering your word and what it is, Uh, teaching not only the Corinthians, but by way of um, uh, application to us also, Lord, I pray that that as we consider this section today, that uh, it will um, move us uh, to apply the principles that Paul is outlining here, the principles of giving, the principles of uh, giving to certainly a Christian ministry, and those things that, that he talks about in this letter to the Corinthians. So, be with us, and, and as we study it, I pray that, um, that I may speak clearly and, um, and not misrepresent. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. So again, we'll, we'll pick up kind of where we left off last week. We, the first, again, this letter, second, our second Corinthian is actually the fourth Corinthian letter. Uh, in chapter 8 and chapter 9, Paul addresses Christian giving, specifically the... Uh, collection or the offering for the impoverished saints in Jerusalem. And as we spoke of the last few weeks in in verses 1 through uh, 9, he describes um, how we as Christians should give. And he's he's describing it to the Corinthians, uh, encouraging them to uh, uh, give to this offering. And uh, and he uses, again, the Macedonians as an example of uh, just uh, the perfect example, really, of Christian giving. Uh, so he describes it using them, and, and he describes just kind of several uh, characteristics of it, um, of giving as a Christian. And, and it should be motivated by the grace God has shown you. <clears throat> it should be joyful. Um, it doesn't really depend on your circumstances. Um, it's according to your means. Okay, and sometimes it can go beyond in, in certain situations like the Macedonians. But it should be generous. It's always voluntary, okay? And it should be Christ-like, uh, Christ-like, because he is the one that actually <clears throat> gave us everything and sacrificed everything for us. And we, we spoke about that last time in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 8. So then... Um, the question is, and, and just kind of this section, this is probably a section of scripture you've read many times. If you're doing the McShane reading for the last few years, you, you come across it. But it's, it's kind of a section you probably don't remember very much. It's very, it's practical, not so much theological. But there are really several things that Paul is telling the church at Corinth and that we can glean from this as to how really we should steward our money because all giving um, is essentially stewardship, okay? Everything we have uh, comes from God. And so the question is, with the resources he's given us, what do we do with them? He's entrusted these resources that are temporary. What do we do with them? How do we um, 
How do we help others? Uh, how do we spend it? How do we spend our time? Um, and as we know, we, we've seen there's really many, many opportunities to give. We see them every day on TV. We see them on the internet. We hear them on the radio. We, we hear them in churches. So the opportunities are, are multiple, but the question is, you know, how do we, how do we discern where we give and how we spend our money? Um, because as we all know, sadly enough, there's all those, many of those opportunities to give can be fraudulent. Uh, even in the church, the church is certainly not immune from that problem. Uh, we see ministers, uh, I use that term loosely, but uh, professors of the word who prey on the poor and the weak and to pad their own pockets. I mean, that's a sad, sad state, and they do it in the name of Christ. And so uh, we have to be very, very cautious. We have to be very, very discerning. And when we look at, at how we uh, give and spend our money, we, we should look um, following some of the principles that Paul tells the Corinthians here. Um, so ministries can be um, well-meaning, uh, but still they can be um, racked by um, no accountability, uh, putting the money in the hands of someone who maybe is not biblical, maybe is not knowledgeable to know this is what we're supposed to be doing with it. They could put it in the hands of an accountant, and, and things could go awry from there. Uh, they could be just outright uh, deceivers like many that you see on TV that, that the money they get does nothing but buy their Learjets and their Armani suits and stuff. So, so you, you need to be really careful about, about where you give your money. And that's where Paul really gives some very practical uh, applications here uh, for the saints. And again, he specifically, he's, this letter is speaking to the Corinthians. He's encouraging them to give to this offering for the saints in Jerusalem who we had talked about before are impoverished, uh, they're poor, uh, they don't have the, the uh, needs of daily life. And so that is the purpose for it. So, but as he's writing this, again, remember, Paul is still kind of under attack by these false teachers. And so although he's kind of reconciled with the church there at Corinth, and many of them have, have come back to Paul, there's still going to be that, uh, that faction, I guess, inside the church that's going to look at everything Paul does through a microscope. And they're going to even level some of the accusations they had against him before, like, like Paul, you know, you're, you're, you're just in it for the money. You know, you're, you're a deceiver. You're, um, you know, we don't, we don't think you're, you've got a different agenda than what you're telling us. And that's kind of the, the thing that was going on in Corinth that the false teachers were raising um, in order to get their foot in the door. So in this section, he speaks in section in chapter 8 and chapter 9 through about verse 5. He, he speaks to the church at Corinth who would be the giver, the one that would be giving money to this offering. And then he speaks about who's going to be receiving it, okay, the, the church at, uh, um, in Jerusalem. Um, and then he speaks about kind of the administrators of it. Who's going to be taking care of the money? How's that going to happen? And again, Paul, because he's really under the scrutiny of these false teachers, as he writes this, he, he kind of anticipates what they might come back with him saying. Because if they're, if they're already kind of against Paul and they think he's in it for the money, and then they give this big offering to Paul and say, you're going to take it to Jerusalem, how do they really know, you know, that, that's something they're going to say, well, Paul, see, I told you. You know, that's, they're going to go back to that church at Corinth, see, Paul, he took it all himself, and he did it. So, so Paul anticipates a lot of these problems that might arise by taking this offering. And that's where the idea of Christian ministries, and that's where he kind of lays down a little bit of groundwork as to how this particular offering was going to be taken care of. Uh, just to allay any fear that they have. So, so as, we, as we look to give to a Christian ministry or a church, um, I think a few questions you have to ask for, well, what do we look for? 
Okay. Well, number one, you got to look for what's the purpose of the ministry. What, what's it going to do? Is it going to evangelize the gospel? Is it going to feed the poor? Uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the purpose behind it? This particular offering was to feed the poor and the needy at the church in, in Jerusalem. Then you have to ask yourself kind of who's in charge or who's handling it. Um, and that's really very important because if you, if you place this in a, um, like I said, an accountant's hand who maybe is really good with numbers and stuff like that, but does not have the biblical foresight or the biblical knowledge to say this is how this should be taken care of, you know, it's subject, it's liable to, uh, uh, to fraud, to say the least. And so, so the, the purpose of it certainly should be biblical. Um, like you said, spreading the gospel, needy things like that. And, and you have to ask yourself, is it run by the principles that are outlined in the Bible? Okay. So you kind of have to uh, ask yourself those questions. And so, so Paul kind of does that in, in the one we'll talk about today and really tomorrow also. So let's just kind of go to our, um, to our verses again today uh, and start in verse 10. And Paul says, in this matter I give my judgment. Okay, this matter, he's talking about the offering that they're giving to the uh, church um, at Jerusalem. He goes, I give my judgment. And again, that judgment really is kind of his opinion. Um, it's the same word he used um, on your scriptural reference there in the, in the first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 7 when he was answering questions about marriage that the uh, Corinthians had. And he says um, uh, in chapter 7, verse 25 of 1 Corinthians, he says, Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. So he's giving his opinion in the matter in 1 Corinthians and in the matter here, and in verse 40 of chapter 7, yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. Um, so he's given an opinion, a judgment. He's not given a command again. Uh, we, we spoke to that, that all giving in the New Testament is uh, voluntary giving. It's not by command. It's not a percentage. It's not a certain amount. So if you're going to a church that tells you you're supposed to give 10%, probably need to find a different church because that's just not biblical. You know, you can give 10%, don't get me wrong. You can give whatever you want, but the idea is it's voluntary, it's free will, it's according to what you have. Uh, it does not have to be a percentage or an amount. So again, he reiterates it's not a command to give to this offering, um, but he says, I give this judgment, and here's his judgment. This benefits you. So he's telling the church at Corinth that if you give this money to the offering to the uh, church in Jerusalem, that this is actually benefiting you, benefiting you. And so how does that do that? Well, we've talked about that the last several weeks also. Uh, a couple of scripture references that we read here. But in God's economy, giving uh, is more beneficial to you than the receiver. You know, you know Jesus says it's better to give than to receive. Okay, because he's saying when you receive, you're, you're getting something from another man, right? Okay, but in con God's economy, when you give, what you receive comes from God. The blessing comes from God. So, and, and he speaks of that in Proverbs 19, 17. Uh, he says, uh, whoever is generous to the poor, generous to the poor lends to the Lord. And he will repay him for his deed. I mean, the Lord will repay him for his deed. So what we get, how this benefits, how giving benefits us is the Lord repays us. And 2 Corinthians 9, 6, I've probably quoted that every week, the last few weeks. It says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. And that's in the, in the context of giving. If you give a little bit, you get a little bit back. Okay, so it's proportional to what you give as to how God blesses you, um, plain and simple. And then Jesus said in Luke six thirty eight, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. Again, you're going to get back more than what you give. You're going to get back pressed down, shaken together. You're going to get back so much uh, 
from God that um, you can't even count it. So that's what Paul would say here. This how, that's how it benefits you. Let's get down to Hebrews 13, 16. Um, the writer of Hebrews says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So giving is pleasing to God. Giving benefits the giver more than the receiver. Um, and then First, Ty- First Timothy. Um, let's read that, chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. This is Paul's advice to Timothy, and he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. So he doesn't say, and nowhere in the Bible does it say that it's bad to be rich, okay? But here's the charge. They're not to be proud of it. They're not to be haughty. They're not to flaunt it, nor set their hopes on it, because... Riches are fleeting. Riches can be fleeting. There's the uncertainty of riches, which we'll get to in just a little, uh, a few few verses down also. So they can do that, but but they rely on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So again, we have to understand everything we have comes from him. It comes from him for us to enjoy. And then verse 18, this is what they should do. They're to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. And that's kind of what Paul is telling the Corinthians here about sharing with the church in Jerusalem. Remember, the church of Macedonia, they begged for the opportunity to give to this offering. Uh, Paul now is teaching, is telling by using their example that we should share also. The church in Corinth being somewhat better off, more wealthy than certainly the church in Jerusalem and certainly in Macedonia because he compares that to them. So here's in in verse 10. Let's go back to verse 10. So my judgment, it benefits you to give, okay? And he says, uh, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So a year ago, this thing was started. Um, and so they began to give a year ago. Well, what happened in the meantime? Well, in Paul's case, we'll go over that in a second, but, but we as humans kind of also have that same problem. We kind of start something, desire to do it. It sounds really good. But sometimes through, you know, you lose interest, you get sidetracked, uh, you get busy, Sometimes you kind of count the costs and you say, yeah, we just can't do that. But there's, as, as humans, that's, that's part of what we do. We lose interest and we stop. And again, the Corinthian church had started a year, a year ago, but probably a little, they had the desire to do it. And it doesn't say that they lost that desire, but they were influenced by those false teachers that came in. They were influenced by those teachers speaking poorly of Paul and accusing him of these things. And somehow they get to thinking in their mind that, you know, once you kind of lose confidence in the guy you're giving the money to, your giving probably goes way down. And that's probably what happened in Corinth. That's what it seems to, to have happened as well. So, so again, the, it's probably a good place to kind of go the chronology of Paul's relationship to that church because it kind of bears into what he, he says coming up. Um, remember, the church was founded in Acts 18. Okay, we, we, we're in Acts 18. It goes along perfectly. Uh, after he found, he stayed there about 18 months, 20 months maybe, went to Ephesus. And from there, he wrote a letter, kind of a correctional letter that it refers to in the book of 1 Corinthians, okay, uh, that, uh, that he, he'd probably already made mention of this offering to the saints. Because in the book of 1 Corinthians, at the end of it, in chapter 16, he goes, now, uh, this is concerning the offering to the saints that he had already told them about at some point in the past. So he answers some of the questions that the church at Corinth would have had about this offering. And he said things like, you put it aside the, the first day of the week, as you may prosper. You know, I don't want to have any collection when I, I don't want to have a big collection when I get there. I don't want to be collecting when I get there, he goes, but you have put it aside all that time. So 
In 1 Corinthians, he gives them some instructions on how this should be handled. Um, but then the, the false teachers kind of got in the church. Again, we, we spoke of this before. They, um, they attacked Paul, his motives, um, kind of led a, a somewhat of a rebell rebellion. Paul heard this. He makes a painful visit, which he refers to um, earlier in the book of 2 Corinthians. A painful visit. He goes back to Ephesus and he writes what he describes as the severe letter back to the church at Corinth. That's not a letter we have in the canon, but he refers to it. And he said that letter was severe enough that it grieved the church at Corinth, but it grieved them into repenting. It actually had the intended purpose that it had. So then once they kind of, um, once they have repented, the church at Corinth has repented, and then Paul writes 2 Corinthians, which is actually the fourth letter that we know of that he wrote to him. He writes 2 Corinthians just because he knows that uh, the problem's probably not completely over. There's still going to be that influence of some of the false teachers or people in the church that sided with them. Uh, so he kind of writes this then um, uh, addressing those particular issues, okay? And, and particularly in chapters 8 and 9, then he goes back to addressing this offering to the saints that they had started a year ago. Okay, so that's kind of where we stand right now with Paul and the church at Corinth. Um, so in, in verse 10, then he goes, um, um, he, he makes the mention that you started it, but you really desired to do it. And that's the, the, the key is they desired to do it. They weren't forced to do it. They weren't coerced into do it. They desired to do it, uh, as is every, uh, New Testament given. It's from the heart. It's voluntary. Uh, it's not required is not coerced. You know, we, should, um, we shouldn't give out a, a compulsion or a coercion, uh, but we give because we want to give, plain and simple. Um, and then verse 11, he, he goes on, okay, so now finish, <laughs> okay, now finish doing it as well. So he started a year ago, and now he's encouraging them, you need to finish what you started. Okay, again, we talked about that happens. People's Many people start well, but finish poorly. And so he's, he's telling the church at Corinth, he goes, okay, now if you desired to do this a year ago, that you in your mind thought this was a worthy ministry to give to, that, that, that I, Paul, and the other apostles were worthy to handle it, and this was for the need of other believers in the church at, um, at, uh, in Jerusalem, he goes, you as a giver should be faithful to finish what you started. Finish what you started. So, so, and, and, and we as givers should, if we feel that the ministry we're giving to is worthwhile and does follow biblical principles and is doing work for the Lord, if we make a pledge, we should follow through. Okay, if we start giving, we should finish whatever we, we promised. Okay, um, and again, one of our greatest failures is that we tend to not to finish things we start. That, that's part of our human nature. Um, many will start, many will, but not all will finish. Um, and mostly it's our own fault, okay? Mostly it's our own fault because of what we spoke of earlier. But, you know, again, in the Corinthians case, they had this other influence that came in. And we're not immune from other influences coming in and saying, you know, you, you're giving money to that or things like that or, or try to run it down. But certainly in the case of the church at Corinth, these false teachers by running down Paul and, and say, speaking that he was, you know, um, he was crafty, he was cunning, he had ultimate, ulterior motives. Um, you know, Paul addresses some of those in, in his, that we've talked about the past several weeks. And uh, in chapter 4, verse 2, uh, uh, he says, we do not practice cunning. Uh, translate, we do not walk in craftiness. We're you know, we're not peddlers of God's word. We are, we are who we say we are. We're sincere uh, in front of God and man. Um, and so although Paul was not guilty of what he was being accused of, just that doubt that was put into the church at Corinth's mind certainly would have plummeted the giving that they would be given to this offering that Paul was essentially in charge of for them. So... Um, and that's just the way it works, too. If you lose faith in who you're giving it to, if you lose faith in your leaders, you won't give, okay? 
other, and the other side, if it's a, uh, if you do continue to have faith in who is leading you, who is doing this particular ministry, what it's going for, uh, and God moves on your heart, you know, that, that is why and that's how we are supposed to give in the New Testament. So to continue then in, um, in verse 11, the second half of that, so he enchides them, okay, finish doing it, okay, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it, in, completing it out of what you have. Again, God's not asking you to give something you don't have. He's asking you to give out of what you have, out of what you have, motivated by God's grace and motivated by your heart. Um, the, uh, the desire should, again, I can't reiterate this enough, the desire to give should come from the heart. And um, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, um, right there in the middle of your page, uh, Paul says this, and he'll say in just a few, a few verses down, he says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Okay, not reluctantly, <laughs> Or under compulsion, so you're not going to be coerced into doing it, or reluctantly. That's not that's not the way that we are taught to give. Um, we taught because we want to. Our heart has been moved by a certain thing, and that's why we give. And this was never any more evident than in Exodus 35. The next couple verses down here, um, uh, Moses is going to build this uh, tabernacle, this temple. And so God told him to take a contribution from the children of Israel. Uh, and in Exodus 35, 5, he says, Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. It says, Whoever is of generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, bronze. And he goes on to list everything that was needed to build the temple in there, which I left out. But this was a not a command. This was a voluntary free will offering demonstrated even in the Old Testament. And then he goes on um, later on after it, it discusses all these whose heart moved them to bring a contribution. He says, and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him, everyone whose spirit moved him and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of the meeting for all his services for holy gardens. Verse 22, so they came, both men and women, all were, who were of a willing heart. And they brought brooches, earrings, they brought all sorts of things, okay, giving, giving entails all that. So the idea is, though, it's your desire to do it, it's from the heart, it's voluntary, it's not coerced. And he gave proportionally. He says, again, back to our verse, um, completing out of what you have, okay? He's not telling you to give something you don't have, which seems kind of common sensey to me, but... But when you, you give, you know, people nowadays give on their credit card, right? And I would say this. Um, this is my opinion, okay? If, you, if you're giving to the Lord on your credit card, and that credit card is not paid off every month, okay, whose money are you giving? You're giving money you don't have, Correct? Okay. On the other hand, if your your credit card paid off every month, and that's that's your pattern for how you use your credit card, you know, in my opinion, that's okay. But if it's something that you're borrowing, you're paying on every month, it's money you don't have essentially. So, um, and I don't think there are credit cards back then, so I don't think that's what Paul is referring to. That's just kind of my opinion. Now. But but he's saying you don't you you don't give what you don't have. You give out of what you have, okay? Um, and, um, and Jesus tells us in Luke 16, I think I, I wrote that on, yeah. Um, it says, one who's faithful in very little is also going to be faithful in much. And that is so, so true. You know, many times people will say, well, if I just had more, I'd give more, okay? Okay. Um, well, no, you wouldn't. You'd probably do the same. If you're faithful in what God has given you, uh, you'll be faithful if he gives you more. Okay? Okay, but it's faithful. And, and the one who's dishonest, if you're dishonest in a very little, if you're keeping back things because you think you can't afford it, okay, the same thing's going to happen even if you get more. That's the way the heart works. That's the way the fallen heart works. So 
So we give not out of what we don't. We give proportionately. Um, we give out of what we have. We give from the heart. Uh, and if your heart should, should kind of move you like it did the Corinthians to give sacrificially, uh, maybe above their, beyond their means, uh, and you can, you can sacrifice other things to give, that's between you and God. Okay, that's, that's something that you and God uh, uh, know. So, um, so again, you're not, it's, you're not required, you're not coerced, you don't do it reluctantly, you give from the heart. Um, and then in verses, or verse 12, he says, um, again, for if the readiness is there, that eagerness, that desire to give it, okay, it's acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. And we just talked about that. You can't give what you don't have. And God doesn't expect you to give what you don't have. Um, and then verses 13 through 15, oh, we'll be good here, okay. Um, Paul then now addresses how that money is going to be used, okay? And he's kind of anticipating, uh, again, those false teachers or those who sympathize with the false teachers in the church, kind of uh, attacking Paul that, you know, Paul, well, that church in Jerusalem, that's primarily Jews, right? And, and it was. I mean, the, the, the first Christian church in Jerusalem was out of all the pilgrims that were there for the festivals, and they were primarily Jews. Uh, these Gentile churches, Corinthians, fewer Jews out there, probably more Gentile in ethnicity, okay? So the false teachers in this thing may say, well, Paul, you got, you know, you're a Jew, you want to take care of your Jews, you know, you're probably thinking, well, you know, back then when, before Paul was Paul, when he was Saul, he was killing a bunch of these Jews. <laughs> and, um, and so you're just you're kind of guilty for that. You want to try to you try to want to try to make him feel better. You want to ease you know what's going on there. So he he kind of anticipates that. And so in verse 13 he says, uh, "For I don't mean that others should be eased and you burdened." Okay, so he's not saying I don't want you to give to burden yourself. God doesn't want you to give to burden yourself. Okay, and we're not you're not burdening yourself so that they can have some type of ease and comfort. You know it's their need, and that is the purpose for it. Um, and he goes on to say, uh, again, uh, fairness, okay, uh, for, but it's a matter of fairness at the end of verse 13. It says, but that as a matter of fairness, verse 14, your abundance at the present time should supply their need. But then he goes on, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. Now, that word in King James is translated equality. And I think we have to understand what it means because Paul's not saying um, that everyone's going to be equal. Okay, that, that never happens. He's not, he's not wanting them to give to the church um, in Jerusalem so that monetarily everyone is equal. It's not like communism where you, you give to the government and they divvy it up and everybody gets the same thing. Okay, that's, that's not what he's talking about doing. He's talking about fairness. Fairness is a better, I think, translation for what Paul's trying to say. Um, it would be like um, the early church. You remember when uh, the, uh, those that had resources, those that had land, would sell the land and use the money to take care of those in the church that had need. Okay. They weren't selling that land and the, money, and the money to make everybody the same, okay, equal, but they're taking care of a need, the need that they had, a need. And that, that's what Paul is speaking of here. We're not, um, it's not a, and you know, many of the cults did that. They, 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 they did it poorly. They could take this verse or something like that and say, okay, you give all your money, we'll divvy it out, everyone's going to be the same, um, I think Jim Jones did that, but, you know, anytime that that is done, we're all, everyone is equal out here, um, somebody's getting rich. <laughs> somebody's getting the brunt of it. Um, uh, you know, and you think about, I don't know, I, I won't throw out any more names than I already have, but, but that's kind of, that's not the idea. The idea is to take care of a need. If you're going to share, 
in the church with a brother, it's for a need. It's for a need. It's not that everyone is going to be exactly equal. And I think it's really a couple of things. Let me just, yeah, let me just say what well, Matthew Henry kind of put, puts it like this. He, he says this whole thing of, uh, that Paul is speaking of here is under divine providence, okay? And what he means by that is that, okay, there are some that have an abundance, okay, and some that have little. But that's under God's providence, okay? God distributed things of the world as he sees fit, to who he sees fit, right? We understand that at this church. Um, but he also then goes into the, uh, the uncertainty of riches, or he calls it the mutability of human affairs, basically meaning that it could change to tomorrow. And that's what Paul's saying here. You know, he's saying in verse... Um, uh, as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need. So he's saying it could change tomorrow. It could change tomorrow. That is, that is, what, that is what Paul is saying here. And, and Matthew Henry, and he really kind of makes you think about things. He said, well, okay, if, if Paul's talking about everybody being equal, okay, have the same thing, then there'd be... No reason to give that guy anything. He's the same as you are, or that guy the same thing. He's got, we're all equal, right? So he's not talking about that, but he's talking about me. And he says that God, uh, it's, there'd be no need for charity. There'd be no need for giving everybody if everybody had the same thing, okay? But there's always going to be those that need. And there's always going to be those that have an abundance. And so in the church, the way that works is just what he says. At the time that you have the abundance, you should have that desire for charity. You should have that desire to help those in need. You should share with those. You should be generous. That's what he's saying, so that we can all have what we need. That's what, he, that's what he's speaking of in the church. So, so the equality is not, um, is not equal, equal. The equality is, or is fairness, okay? We should take care of our brothers and sisters. I'm going to run out of time. And then he, he finishes up by giving an illustration. And if you turn with, me to, turn with me to Exodus chapter 16, if you would. This is a quote from Exodus chapter 16. And we all know about, uh, about the manna. Uh, the manna from heaven. Um, give me just a minute here. Come on. Okay. <laughs> pop-ups yeah that's crazy um all right what is that exodus chapter 16 all right so the children of israel were in the wilderness they were out there grumbling because they didn't have anything to eat um the lord heard them they were grumbling against moses but in essence they're grumbling against god <clears throat> and then he's gonna give he's gonna feed them he's gonna give them the manna okay verse 14 of chapter 16 and when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. Hmm. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. They had never seen anything like that. It's still nothing like that. And Moses said to that, it's the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Verse 16, this is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall take an omer according to the number of the persons you have in the tent. So an omer is just a measurement that they have, and it's kind of insinuating that an omer is about how much a person eats in a day. Okay, so you should take an omer, okay? Uh, in verse 17, and the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. So if you, if you picture what's going on there, in your tent, which has your whole family, generations in it, there will be some that were strong and healthy could gather because there's kind of a time constraint as the dew melted this stuff i guess didn't hang around real long the young healthy ones would gather more and the maybe the older ones would gather less okay that's kind of what happened but then they come back to their tent okay um verse 17 the people of israel did so they gathered some more some less but when they measured it with an omer which was the daily rations uh, i guess whoever gathered much had nothing left over, 
and whoever gathered little had no lack. So the idea there is they gather it. There are some that have the ability to gather more, okay? They get back to the tent, though, and they share. They, they kind of divide, divide it up. And that's, that's kind of the illustration that Paul uses how the church should be in giving, in need, in Christian ministries. That's, you know, the church at large, the, church, the worldwide church that, uh, is what he's speaking of here. And certainly in a local church that can happen, but it extends past that. Uh, so that's what he's saying. It's, it's not a matter so much of, uh, of equality. It's a matter of sharing. It's a matter of sharing what you have because the Lord tells us that's what you have. And if you don't, um, down there in verse um, 1 John 17, or 1 John 3, uh, John says, If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? And that's so too. He, he's questioning that person's salvation. You know, if you can see this and not have your heart open to him and not share, he rightly so questions that that person is, is truly saved. So, so that's the idea there. Paul, Paul is saying we give out of what we have. We give of our abundance. We give to those in need. And again, I, you probably... So I Second Thessalonians, and it doesn't mean the church will take care of people who refuse to work. Okay, Paul addressed that in Thessalonians. Uh, you know, if anyone is not willing to work, let them not eat. So, so anyone who is willing to do that is, is kind of presuming upon the church, is presuming upon God's uh, generosity uh, by doing that. So that's not the idea there. But there are going to always going to be those in need. So, so we should. Um, we should open our hearts to them, and we should give out of, out of our abundance out of what we have. So let's pray. I think I ran over time. Okay. Father, we again thank you so much for this time that we can uh, consider your word. We, we pray that, um, that our hearts will be opened, uh, that you will open them to those in need, that you will uh, show us um, what we should do, who we should do that for, and also give us the discerning nature to know that as we are um, uh, doing that, uh, that we are honoring you. And we also understand that more we give, the more you just bless us. And that's um, uh, a blessing that, uh, that in your economy uh, is much better than uh, the human economy. So, Lord, be with us today then as we go to uh, worship you in song and word. In your son's name, amen.